Yeah, I'll put it finding our space and I'd like it to be probably just a bit of time for um, thinking. It's more, it's, it is late in the afternoon, so it is a time for a reflection. And I guess I'd like us to reflect a bit about our community, but also reflect a bit about ourselves. That's what the idea of finding our space was, is what role um, are we going to play in terms of um, shaping our community in a place we wish to live. So I've said, reflect upon how the world is changing and also consider the opportunities that might be out there that suit us. Uh, I also threw a few other words up there just to, because I thought they were important and they will become important with how we shape our society and shape our business opportunities as we go along and especially this area of community, clusters, cooperation. That has been a theme coming through here, especially the area of networking and I think that is going to be a pretty significant theme for us. So I can start off with a, a, a quick quiz. Um, Amerigo Vespucci, uh, I put him up there. One thing about him, on um, Monday, he'll be 451. Well, he would be if he was still alive. Uh, I guess in some ways his name has a, a, a ring of familiarity, um, and it probably has a ring of familiarity because America was named after him. So he's a bit more familiar for us now for that reason. But in his time, he was uh, very uh, famous for saying that, which uh, in our terms is new world. And he said, there's a new world out there being the Americas, and it has enormous opportunities for us in terms of cultural and economic development. And he was right, because the discovery of that new world did bring enormous economic and cultural development. My suggestion today is that we have a, a new world again. We have a new world in front of us now, but the new world is no longer the Americas. We can see the Americas is missing from our map there, and it's been replaced by things like eBay, PayPal, YouTube. It's been replaced, well, one other thing I guess has not been replaced by that comes in here is also big data. So we have a new world out there which does have tremendous economic and tremendous cultural opportunities for us, but it's a different new world from the Americas. It's a digital new world. Referred to in many ways, but one great description of it is a virtual agora or a digital agora. Let's think a little bit about the history of agoras and what they did for Greek civilization. It was a place where people got together and chatted and they made decisions. And then because people got together and chatted and made decisions, that then led on to trade. And trade in ideas and trade in goods and capital. So that digital agora has now become a really significant space for people to participate. And one other thing that it's done is remove geography as a limitation for people participating in that space. And that's part of the things, especially in the world that we are, has been a massive opportunity because people can travel into that space, they can trade, they can acquire skills, and then they can travel back out of that space without leaving their geography. So um, our world now has a virtual dimension. And that's a virtual dimension that's created opportunities for us. Here's something that goes back um, 15 years almost, 14 years. And it's just an interesting reflection on that when someone said, the increased rate of technological innovation appears to be causing tectonic shifts in our structure of industries. And again, it's interesting that tectonic shifts getting back almost to the, the geography because it is to describing the, in a sense, what is happening. Because those tectonic shifts are creating spaces. And that's where our opportunities are going to be. What in fact is happening is our world is getting bigger. We hear about how our world's got smaller, which it has because of improved communication, ease of travel, but it's got much bigger in terms of spaces. Now those spaces may be weird sizes, and they may be small, and they may not all be together, but that probably suits us. We can think about what we can do about those spaces. So 
we are moving into a new world. The new world is not going to be a place for those that don't adapt. So we are going to have lots of businesses that now exist that don't exist. And we have people talk about um, here how we could have loss of jobs. Uh, overall, uh, I, the net loss of jobs, I think if you think we're going to have loss of jobs uh, overall, you're living on a different planet than what I think I'm living on because there's going to be enormous growth in things. Our opportunity is just say, well, where is that growth coming? How are we going to tap into it? I'd like to think about some future. We've heard the term micro-multinational already. So some of the opportunities we may have is in this area of micro-multinationals. You want to talk particularly for Armidale? What's things that we can do excellently? What, yeah, what is a micro-multinational? How does it relate to Armidale? Do we have capacities in this area? So typically they're going to be owner-operated. But they're not going to be excessively constrained by geographic borders. They can operate in many different countries. We heard Peter Cull here yesterday, business located in Armidale, owner-operated business operating in, out of 45 different countries. Some other things that they're going to have is what I think are some positives compared to the, the, the normal multinationals that we talk about. I suspect there's going to be a, a much greater social consciousness and in part because they're not so focused on profit. Profit is important, but it won't be the only measure of success. So they're also more likely to participate in their local communities. They're very well suited to fitting into spaces. They can react quickly. The micro-multinational is more likely to, to mould itself to fit in those spaces. But in one of the things that technology has done has removed a lot of the barriers to entry. One thing that's often been uh, stopped business from growing, got things harder to go, is the barriers to entry. And technology has got a great deal to do with reducing that. Now, it still has probably um, difficulties in, in growth, but part of it is it makes it much easier for business to get started, people develop skills and develop confidence. I'd like to have some thought about how um, the, the new version of the micro-multinational and this is, how it operates in the, the, the digital economy may vary from the traditional small business that we have. Because there was a whole host of reasons for failure of small businesses um, and ha how do they apply and what are the advantages or disadvantages for um, a micro-multinational that operates in, a, in the digital world. So there was the the lack of, there was a, it was very hard for businesses to get started, there was the lack of, the lack of experience, the lack of capital. The lack of experience often related to lack of experience in the particular business and also <clears throat> the lack of experience in the industry. In terms of micro multinationals, because it's much, e well, let's say digital businesses generally, it doesn't have to be uh, a multinational, digital business generally can be very easy to start. People can start that in their own homes and just get started. And often the costs for getting the business going are in terms of their time, not necessarily in terms of the business. In terms of experience, <coughs> the, the ex a lot of the experience can be gained by just getting out there and doing it. Because as we said, the costs are much lower, so the costs of failure are not as significant. So you go out, have a go at something, you've invested some of your time, you've learned along the way. Some other problems used to be issues with businesses was getting started, was making sure you've got the proper planning done. Now, planning is still important, um, but again, a lot of the planning now can happen as the business goes. Part of the acquiring information stage is just getting out there and doing the business. And again, the last two things we've got there are, in a sense, are related in those topics we keep coming back to here, is the importance of networks to share ideas that uh, one of the other dramas of business is often getting, well, the 80% of the way through the business. I guess many of us have heard of the 80-20 rule, that you get 80% of your results from 20% of your effort. And often the businesses can, their first 20% of their effort can make them 80% of their progress towards getting going, but that last 20% is really tough. And often it needs help from someone else. 
someone to push them over the line, someone to give them some confidence. And so those networks are still going to become important, but how we, what are we going to do about developing those networks? Um, some of the areas that we may have spaces. Where, where could we potentially have spaces? And there's going to be an enormous amount of spaces for businesses, and especially here we're talking about the digital economies. Um, I've just put a few up here, just as a starting point. And, and people will think about their own. One area I've put here that might act as a potential checklist is the area of big data. Now, maybe we just say data, data generally, because what was big data once is now not be, becoming not so big data. And also we need to respond to um, environmental issues. And I think that's another area that we have a great deal of potential talent in here and there's already a number of businesses in this region that are doing issues related to solving environmental problems. And clearly the environmental problems we're going to have, and I've already heard people here talking about it, are going to become far more substantial. And again, they're part of the spaces that we've talked about these tectonic shifts. There'll be spaces there that we can fit into that we can provide solutions to. The, and again, I so said we need to keep coming back to um, also developing expertise in, um, in clusters, in bringing people together and we've heard about you know, the networks and the incubators. Uh, so they're clearly going to have a, a role. They'll have a role in a few ways. One is they'll have a role in getting our businesses started and helping businesses grow. But this is the type of thing that's really got to happen all over the world eventually. And if we can develop some expertise in growing businesses, that in itself will become um, some type of product. But why has big data become such an issue? And basically it's because we're getting better at stuff and it's becoming so much cheaper and communication is improving so much and the, you know, the, quali the, the quality of things we can do is just becoming so much better. So, um, you know, one of the <coughs> things that I guess I hear people talking a lot about later is now um, we've got to the stage where the storage capacity for data is doubling roughly every 40 months. So in terms of our university community, uh, community you think about that's much, not, not that much longer than a degree. So in one way of looking at that is that if you look at the amount of data that's stored now, people starting at a degree, the amount of information that's stored, that's been stored over, over all of history, but while they're studying their degree, that much data will be stored again. So that's why data is going to become significant and understanding how to process data, understanding especially how to analyse data. Looking at the, some of the stages in big data also provides a bit of a checklist, I believe, for business opportunities. So we can look at some of these areas in terms of the first step with big data is how you record it. How do we capture that information? And they were talking about remote sensors. So what are the businesses that we could have developed in terms of capturing data? Then how do we go about categorising that information, storing it, indexing it? What businesses can we build around that? Um, then finally moving, well, go through the whole process necessarily, but a big area is clearly going to be in reporting that data and then analysing that data and saying what that data means. Yeah, we could break those steps down um, into, into a lot more detail. And if, but we also need to look at the dangers of big data. What are the ramifications of having all of your buying history stored somewhere, all of your health records stored somewhere? What are the ramifications of that? What are the dangers? So what mechanisms can we build in? One of the other things that's talked about big data and how it's going to um, change decisions is that um, big data will replace um, hippos with algorithms. What's hippos? Um, so that we are most, one of the most common ways decisions are made in organisations at the moment is the um, highest paid person's opinion. Mm. And it's not necessarily based on evidence, um, 
but that's one of the things that big data can have. It can help us provide those evidence to make decisions more effectively, to make decisions by an algorithm. Now, again, um, there's a lot of dangers in that, but we need to learn how to manage those dangers, which I guess is that area there we need to get to that, what are some of the social and ethical considerations with dealing with that data, and while there are also challenges, there are also the opportunities that we have for develop, developing businesses, for developing solutions that will work towards that. My thought is that Armadale is very well placed to find uh, some of those spaces. And again, we don't have to find too many spaces because there'll be enorm enormous spaces there. And what are some of the reasons why those spaces might be, you know, why Armadale is so suited? And again, obviously the NBN provides enormous advantages to us. We've got the university, which provides a certain way of thinking. Um, it also provides some of the opportunities that Derek talked about before for getting research organised, for providing a, a level of thinking on certain things. But also, it provides significant um, potential workforce. So if we do get some areas growing, well then, there can be a ready workforce who's been trained in those areas and that are here. And so those two are really significant um, advantages. And that's a lot of things that very few other places would have. I would also say at this particular time, um, there's the attitude for Armadale for going ahead, for taking opportunities, for developing the right types of business is really positive. Right? So a lot of people are really keen to work together and we see that cooperation I think is going to be so important. There is going to be enormous opportunity for Armadale, uh, but say there's enormous opportunity for other places. Now, how do we get sufficiently organised to take advantage of that? And it's really going to take um, cooperation. I suppose one thing that also the Tech Fest has displayed, and we've seen some um, examples of great businesses that are here already, and we talked before about the advantage of a, a, a credible example. So we can see that great businesses can operate out of Armadale. They can also provide um, the confidence that others, they can say, hold on, you can live in Armadale and have markets all over the world. What can we do again to build on those? I just thought I'd finish off. I've got a few other things there, but I thought this would be a good place to finish. That um, from Goethe, whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. I can't really, because boldness has a certain magic and power about it. Uh, in one sense, I think, you know, we could, we could look upon TechFest as a bit of a beginning. Is um, We've got all these opportunities there, but what's going to galvanise us so that we get together, we work together to take those opportunities? And I think that's the thought that I'd like to leave us with. Thank you.